Dear friends, grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I have to say that over the years that I've been preaching, which now is getting up around 55 or 56, I've been kind of fortunate. I haven't been yelled at a whole lot. But I have been yelled at a few times. <laughs> and one of my more memorable times of being yelled at was after a sermon I preached most likely about this time of year. Um, normally in our churches, it's around October that we start having our annual stewardship drives, right? And we talk about sharing our gifts for the coming year and all the rest. And on this particular Sunday, man, this fellow moved, came on me with a full head of steam. Second here, make this a little easier. Here's what he had to say. A somewhat paraphrase. <laughs> he said to me, Preacher, you all ought to stick to spiritual stuff and what's in the Bible and what Jesus said and quit talking about money. Well, I thought that was. Interesting. And I'll, I will confess, initially, my first response was to be just a little defensive. I mean, I didn't think I had talked too much about money. And this fellow was being, hmm, a little bit unkind. But as I thought about it a little more, I got kind of sad. Because this was a person who I knew had been around church for years and years and years and no doubt had been encouraged on many occasions to read his Bible. But what he was telling me on that particular morning is he hadn't read the book. <laughs> One uh, must have been rather patient researcher plowed through the whole Bible and counted up all the verses that had to do with wealth or money. You'll never guess how many he found. There are over 2,300 <laughs> references throughout Scripture to wealth and to money. And a whole bunch of them are in the words and parables of Jesus. So why do you suppose that is? Well, part of it is, of course, that our Lord Jesus went to so much trouble, God went to so much trouble in the incarnation to send Jesus into the world that we share, right? God isn't just about some otherworldly, spooky, ghostly thing that goes on in a little corner of the human experience. But God is concerned about all of life, all of our life. And believe me, money is a big part of that. And you know, actually, money is really useful. I mean, it's a lot easier to deal with money, to, to exchange value by handing money in some form back and forth than it is, you know, to have to go to the restaurant and then go back and wash dishes for an hour to pay for your meal. I mean, that's just sort of a cumbersome system. <laughs> right? Money, in and of itself, is just a wonderful way of sharing value. But there's a problem with money. Money, in some ways, is kind of like narcotic drugs. We're having a big problem with those in our country right now. A lot of those drugs are a true blessing for a certain group of people who are desperately in need and suffering terribly. But when their use goes beyond that, people become, we become addicted to them and suddenly they become the center of our whole life. And then they cause terrible problems. And I would suggest to you that the point of our scripture today 
is that money is like that for us. It's a great gift. It's very useful. But when it becomes the very center of our life, everything we work for, hope for, dream for, value, then we're in big trouble. Our gospel today really gets to the heart of that. And it recounts this bittersweet encounter between Jesus and this rich young man. It was great. You meet this guy, and you think, he's really not too bad a fella. I mean, he comes up, he is clearly uh, not overly proud, he, he bows at the feet of Jesus. I would also say that he is pretty conscientious. He asks the question, well, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus goes through the commandments. Oh, he says, man, I've done those. <laughs> Ever since I was a little kid, I've paid attention to the commandments. And right at the point where you would think that Jesus might have shaken his hand or patted him on the shoulder and said, Adam, boy, you've done really great. There's a kind of Lucy in the football moment. <laughs> and the rug is jerked right out from under him because Jesus, in one sentence, goes right to the heart of this guy's problem. He's the center of his own story. He's in the middle of everything. He thinks it's all about him. And so Jesus says, you just lack one thing. Go. Gather up all your stuff and sell it and give it to the poor. And then come and follow me. Whoa. This guy was crushed. Everything up to that point just been great. And now this. And he walks away grieving. Now the disciples were aghast. They were aghast because it was generally thought that, you know, if you were rich, that somehow meant that you were particularly blessed by God. And this guy wasn't only rich, he was a nice guy. <laughs> he was a good guy. He seemed to really be working hard at all of the things that we normally talk about and associate with the godly life. And Jesus says, you got to give all that stuff away. And not only that, but it gets worse, much worse. Jesus tells a parable. He says to the disciples, children, it is harder for a rich person to get into the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to get through the eye of a needle. What? I mean, I, have you ever stood next to a camel? Those buggers are big, <laughs> right? And they're rather amazing creatures. But you know, a needle's eye? Now the disciples were really aghast. And I dare say if we've been paying attention, so are we. We have a lot more than probably that rich young guy did. Harder to get through into the kingdom of God than for a camel to get through the eye of a needle. This has just troubled people ever since. So there have been quite a few scholars that have tried to rationalize this. So there are some that said, well, maybe that was a mistranslation. 
Maybe what he actually said was cable. You know, and you know, if you had a really big needle and maybe the cable wasn't too big, maybe you could get it through. But actually, when you pay attention to the language and then later the context, we know that that's not true. There were other people that said, well, we think there might have been a gate in the wall of Jerusalem called the needle's eye. Because in medieval times, a lot of times they would close the city gates at, at dark so that bandits and robbers and so on couldn't get in. But if you got there late, they might let you leave all your stuff outside the gate, get down on your hands and knees and crawl through this itty bitty tunnel into the city. And the theory was they could knock you off one at a time because otherwise you couldn't get in. And so people have thought, you know, picture this camel down on its knees, its nose stretched way out, about five guys pulling on the rope. Maybe we could get them through there. Well, there's no evidence that there was such a gate in Jerusalem, but more than that, at the end of the story, Jesus just makes it all very clear. Jesus says, it's impossible. It's impossible. And so the disciples are like, wait a minute. If this rich guy who does all the right stuff obviously is blessed by God and is a good guy, well then, who can be saved? I mean, we're all in big trouble here. Who can be saved indeed? But then Jesus gives an answer that is both kind of cryptic and profound. And it really gets to the heart of what this story is all about. Jesus says, with men, with us, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You see, the problem for our rich young man is not that he was rich. You can do wonderful things with money. The problem with the rich young man is a very, very basic problem that has plagued us as human beings since the very beginning. It takes us right back to the very first commandment, right? What does it say? It says, you shall have no other gods before me. <laughs> so whatever it is, that gains our highest loyalty, our greatest trust, gets our effort, our hard work, our passion, and all the rest that is most important. That's God for us. And God's saying here, it doesn't work for me to be second place. Again, it's not the problem that this young man was rich. It's the problem that he was confusing the gift with the giver. And that's been a problem for us all the way along, and it still is. If we put our faith, our hard work, our effort, our energy, our trust, our yearning for security and how big our bank account is, and then somehow think that our life in the spirit should somehow be separate and compartmentalized from that. Jesus says, oh no, it's all part of the same thing. You shall have no other gods. Now there might be a few of us who say, oh yeah, but you know, I'm different. <laughs> I really have been good and I really do. Well, remember what Paul said. For everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Thankfully, he doesn't just quit there, because that would be pretty bad, right? He goes on to say, therefore, we are justified by faith through grace. It's about what God does, not about what we can do. And what is it that gives you and I value? You know, the world we live in would argue that um, we're valuable based on our net worth, the total of our assets less 
are liabilities, right? You ask somebody, what are you worth? Well, they won't tell you, but they might tell you they're accountant, right? And that's what it is. You know, I'm worth X dollars. Or I have property and stuff worth X. And that's what I'm worth. That's not how the kingdom of God works. The kingdom of God works in this way. God says to us, we have value because he loved us. And because he loved us so much that he sent Jesus to die for us. And what makes us valuable is what God has invested in us. What God has given us. What God's hopes and dreams for us are. Now you might think that this is a little tough. Huh? And in some ways it is. You know, everything about life in the 21st century in America, all our public life, it's all about stuff, isn't it? I mean, if you watch TV, listen to the radio, watch the billboards, listen to conversation, it's, you know, how much do you have? How's your retirement account? Uh, what is your bank account like? Do you have the necessary save? All this stuff. It's just endless. And yet, we are not, as a country, particularly happy. And it seems like all of that stuff gives us tremendous cause for worry because we know, we know how temporary it can be, how ineffective it can be when the end of life comes and all of that. And even though we run the race and we try and pile up as much as we can, we know that it's not going to do it. Jesus offers us another way. He offers us freedom. Not freedom to just do anything we want, willy-willy-nilly, but freedom to be removed from the rat race. Freedom to not think of ourselves in terms of that eternal quest for stuff and money and wealth, but to think of ourselves as redeemed children of God, people freed up to serve one another. Now, some years ago, somebody sent me a card I have no idea why this particular card came to me. But I thought, this is a rather profound observation. It's not what you own that makes you happy, but what gives you joy. Think about that. It's not what you own that makes you happy, but what gives you joy. So, for example, how does it compare to have a kind of a cushy bank account compared to having that little grandchild just learning to walk come screaming up to you, throwing their arms around you because they love you so much? How does it compare? How does it compare to having a life partner who cares about you more than anyone else in the world and who loves you and looks after you and, and wants to do the very best for you? How does it compare to having a sense of your own life that is valuable? What is it that gives the greatest joy of all? Now, I would suggest to you that if we are living free in the way Jesus invites us to live, and if we in fact are able to use the gifts of God not only for ourselves, but as God intended to bless others, to share them, to celebrate them, then we are free to live a life of joy, free to live a life that is full of celebration and hope, even though a lot of things around us may be I would suggest to you that the thing that gives the most joy among a long list of those kinds of things is sharing the love that God first has shown us with those people around us. Last week, I hope you got to be in church last week, either online or here, and you'll remember Celia Richardson's sermon 
I thought of a couple of verses that I was listening to her talk. I thought of that verse from Timothy that says, don't let anyone despise your youth. I thought about what Jesus said when he said, a little child shall lead them. Because this young lady, a confirmation student here, spoke just glowing about how wonderful it had been to work with folks who we would describe as differently able, folks who might struggle with a lot of things in life, but who it turned out had all kinds of special and unique gifts that were her own, their own. And she just rejoiced with the joy that had come into her life by getting to know these folks and help these folks and learn from these folks. I believe that our Lord Jesus calls all of us into that kind of life so that all of us may experience that very special joy. May God grant that to each one of us in our particular corner of the world, wherever it is that God has placed us, so that we may live lives that are truly free and truly lives that are rejoicing and celebrating in God's love.